So hello and welcome to a brand new type of podcast, um, which we've inventively called a ViverCast. Um, this is the first, hopefully, a series of ViverCasts um, in which we're going to do very short overviews of uh, clinical topics in the style that one might expect to be vivid in a PACES or sort of OSCE type um, situation. I'm very pleased today to be do- uh, joined by Jean Lee. Hello. hello. Yeah, who is a, you're an F1. I am, yes. Where are you working currently? West Middlesex. At uh, West Middlesex, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's get on with this first one. So, this first one is about aortic stenosis, um, and we're now going to go into exam mode. So, what did you find on examination? So, this 65 year old lady appears comfortable at rest. Her pulse is regular, with slow rising character, and of small volume. Um, she has a, also has a narrow pulse pressure. Her apex beat was heaving, but not displaced. On auscultation, first heart sound was normal, but the second heart sound was soft. And in addition, I heard a harsh crescendo-decrescendo ejection systolic murmur, loudest in the right intercostal space, heard loudest in expiration, which radiates to both carotids. So in summary, this lady presents with signs that would be consistent with aortic stenosis. What else could this be? Well, it could be aortic sclerosis had it not radiated to her carotids. It could also be an innocent systolic murmur. So my other differentials, which would be less common, would include pulmonary stenosis, a mitral or tricuspid regurgitation, hokum, or ASD or VSD. How might this patient have presented? Well, the most common symptoms would be syncope, angina, particularly exertional angina, and dyspnea. And uh, some patients may also present, although it's not a symptom, with sudden death. Pretty <laughs> unlikely in this case. No. Yeah. What can you tell me about the etiology of this condition? Well, the most common cause is a degenerative valve. Um, other causes could include a congenital bicuspid valve, or Willem syndrome, which is much rarer, of course, and unusually in rheumatic heart disease, where it can also affect the aortic valve. Okay. And how might you investigate a patient who you suspect has aortic stenosis? We could first start with a bedside test, such as an ECG, where I'll expect to see P mitrale, and probably a left ventricular hypertrophy and strain pattern, and even sometimes a left axis deviation. On chest x-ray, the left ventricular hypertrophy would be confirmed, and I could sometimes see a calcified aortic valve. But really what we need is an echocardiogram with a Doppler, with which I can also grade the severity of the aortic stenosis, where severe would be more than 50 millimeters of mercury, with a valve area of less than one centimeter square. Um, ideally, I would like cardiac catheter to assess the valve gradient, the left ventricular function, the coronary artery disease, as well as the aortic root. Very good. And finally, how might you manage a patient with aortic stenosis? Well, it depends on how severe it is, but we can start with conservative measures such as education to tell the patient to avoid competitive sports. In mild and moderate aortic stenosis, we could have annual and clinical echocardiogram review, Um, and medication for symptomatic control, such as beta blockers. But really what we need to cure it would be surgery, which can be either done percutaneously or open surgery. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So that's the end of this podcast. If you enjoyed it, let us know. Um, Hopefully we'll have more to come.